Okay, so we finished chapter seven-ish last time. Um, we'll do a little summary of that and look at some of the Lutheran confessions is what we were gonna begin with today. So we'll just read this really quickly. This was Hebrews seven, uh, beginning in verse 20. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented from death, by death from continuing, but Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever since those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. And so we talked about uh, kind of at length how this whole uh, section, uh, which is actually the pericope for, uh, where? Usually I write this someplace. This is the pericope for, I don't know, I gotta look at my list. It is the read, pointed reading for uh, year B, proper 25. So right near the end of the church year this year, we'll hear that as the epistle reading. Uh, and this whole pericope basically talks about in detail how, okay, the high priests of old, uh, since they were mortal and they were, because they were sinners, they had to make sacrifices for their own sins first, and then they offered the sacrifices for the sins of the people, and then they would eventually die. And you had to have new priests and high priests because these guys were constantly dying because they're mortal, obviously, they don't live forever. And of course, Jesus being a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, being that he is immortal, once he becomes high priest, he is high priest forever, doesn't have to offer sacrifice for his sins because he is sinless, and only had to offer himself once for the sins of everyone. And then we also reviewed a little bit that Melchizedek, in my understanding of it, is a title, not the name of a man. So the Melchizedek is a title, uh, which is how they can say he had uh, no origin and no, no death because the order of Melchizedek is still alive through Jesus Christ because he's still alive. Uh, so Melchizedek is actually a title, not a person. Uh, and there's really good scholarship to support that. The Melchizedek that uh, Abram uh, spoke to was uh, probably uh, Shem, one, one of Noah's sons. He would have still been alive at that time. Uh, and they actually have a kind of neat little chart. You can see when all these people were still alive and who the Melchizedek was all the way through uh, David and then eventually Jesus. Uh, so there's good scholarship. It doesn't matter if you do think Melchizedek was a person a very strange, unique person, that's fine. If you think he's Shem, that's fine. Uh, the point is, Jesus is a high priest after that order, which is ordained by God forever, and uh, separate from the Levitical priesthood, which came after, which came after the giving of the law. Uh, so Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, not the order of the Levitical priests. So he does not follow but in the all those other things. Chapter 7, it's, he was a king. Yes. So it was a person then. Title. Melchizedek means uh, a king of the Most High. That's what the name actually means. So it can be a, it can be a title. It doesn't have to be a name. Oh. Yeah. It, it can be a name. It can be a fellow named Melchizedek. For example, the word Michael means who is like God. So... That's what the name Michael means. So uh, Melchizedek means you know priest of the Most High, or I'm sorry, King of the Most High. Uh, 
Uh, so it can be the name of a man. It could also be a title. So yeah, and uh, yeah, there's an incredible amount of stuff written about it. For somebody that's only mentioned in like four verses of the Bible, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff written about Melchizedek. So the the scholarship that I think makes the most sense is that it was a title that was handed down father to son. Now, but it says down a little bit farther, you know, he's without, without father or mother or any. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which then some people, at least some people to believe that's the pre-incarnate Christ because he was without, you know, without beginning uh -huh. and without end. But I think that's a little too on the nose because that would be basically seeing Jesus as high priest forever, forever after the order of Jesus. And then God doesn't play games like that. Uh, so as much as I love seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament, because he's everywhere, but he's not here. He's not in that, in that story. Uh, so we did talk about that at, at great length. So this last section, just to summarize, uh, right there is where I wrote down, your be proper twin types right in front of me. So this is found near the end of the church year. It's associated with the story of blind Bartimaeus. So I thought it would be interesting tonight to actually look at what that gospel reading is that's read on the same Sunday as this epistle reading. So that's Mark 10. And it's not very long. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46. And it says, When they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he's calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his, regained his sight and began following him on the road. Okay. Where were you reading? Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Oh, okay. I missed the verses. So. Oh, that's okay. Because the beginning of chapter 10 doesn't uh, say that. Yeah, it's right, right at the end, actually. Okay. Okay, so this uh, gospel reading is encouraging people to, to seek mercy from Jesus. And this epistle reading is doing the same thing to as Jesus as our great high priest forever. It encourages people to seek mercy from Jesus because he is the mediator of God's grace. And then we can, like blind Bartimaeus, we receive spiritual sight from him in order to follow him. Just as blind Bartimaeus asked for sight back, his faith made him well, and he immediately began to follow Jesus. So when we follow Jesus as our great high priest, we receive spiritual sight for him in order to follow him back to the Father, which was what this chapter was all about. The whole thing about why Jesus is our intercessor. He is the one that gives us access to the Father. And why this is a good thing and why he is the good intercessor, the one that does this. So, as we said earlier this whole epistle to the Hebrews is number one it's a sermon to be read in worship and it is also about worship so it is about the divine service it covers many of the aspects of the divine service comparing it to worship in the Old Testament and showing how it is now better uh, under the new covenant under Christ so the way that these two readings together can uh, shape the congregation's worship is it revolves around the presence of the risen, exalted Christ. So while Jesus was here on earth, he was healing people and, and doing miracles. Now the risen, exalted Christ is our high priest forever in heaven, intercessing for us, interceding for us, uh, bringing, carrying our petitions to the Father. And then, of course, the divine service culminates in 
heaven coming to earth in the sacrament and Christ is bodily present for us in that sacrament. So we receive then what was given and shed for us. You know, sometimes I think when we ask the Lord for help in a certain way, we aren't, we aren't demanding. I mean, these, some of these people really are almost demanding. You know, yeah, actually, you we know, should. We should demand. But we should because we, we kind of come in a, in a meek way, you know, like, oh, you know. Would you please help me? That's absolutely that's absolutely right, and that and that is something I wish more people would would have that insight because God doesn't expect you to just go, oh hey you know God yeah, if it's not too much trouble when you're not yeah. busy could you maybe kind of do this for me? It's you look at the way the prayers of the church have been written over the centuries, and even our prayer of the church as it's laid out for us on Sunday, it's all strong action verbs. Give, it's like Lord, give us this give me that, do this, forgive me. They're all powerful action verbs. There is no sponginess mm -hmm. at all in the language. Well, that would be a good sermon topic. That probably would be. With the emphasis demonstrating how we should. Let's talk about time. I'm maybe wind that in this week because I am talking about prayer a little bit Sunday, a lot of it. That our prayer needs to be <coughs> yeah. more forceful. But yeah, it's supposed more. to be demanding. God expects you. you know, it's kind of like, oh, I only, I only pray to God when something bad happens. Yeah, that's on us. We, we forget to be thankful for the good things. But when the chips are down and we need him, he expects us to go, God, help me. I'm, I got nothing. You're the only out I have. And he expects that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, he doesn't expect us to be timid. And look at the Lord's Prayer. The, the, there's no wishy-washy there. So, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come. I mean, those are all pretty powerful, active right there, telling God to do what he's going to do anyway. And then give us our daily bread. Forgive well, we us. But we don't say it that way. Right. We don't emphasize it that way. Well, we kind of, we're all saying it together, so it's kind of monotone. But, yeah. We but, don't even know what we're saying sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. Just rambles on. Okay, so still talking about this, this six, uh, section here. It talks... It uses this section like our Lutheran Confessions, which we don't talk about too often. We should maybe one of these days do a Bible study on one of them. Uh, the, the formula of Concord uh, uses this epistle to the Hebrews, these verses we're doing tonight, talking about uh, how Christ is present in the church with the congregation on earth as our mediator and high priest, and how you can picture Jesus facing two different ways when he's speaking, and we'll, we'll, I'll clarify that in a second. This is on the section on, this is Article 8, if you care, of the Formal of Concord. You can read free online if you don't have a Book of Concord at bookofconcord.org. Uh, and you just click on the different things, and there's all kinds of stuff there. Uh, so back in paragraph 77 of Article 8 of the Formal of Concord, we do not understand these testimonies to mean that only Christ's divinity is present with us in the Christian church and congregation, and that such presence does not apply to Christ according to his humanity in no way whatever. For in that way, Peter, Paul, and all the saints in heaven, since divinity, which is everywhere present, dwells in them, would also be with us on earth. However, the Holy Scriptures say this only about Christ and no other man. So talking about how he is both 100% God. Where are you reading? Uh, this is in the Book of Concord. Book of Concord. Oh. So we hold by these words that the majesty of the man Christ is declared. Jesus has received this majesty according to his humanity at the right hand of God's majesty and power. You kind of hear the language of the creed. So also according to his received human nature and with the same, he can be and also is present where he wants to be. He is present especially in his church and congregation on earth as mediator, head, king, and high priest. This presence is not a part or only one half of him. Christ's entire person is present, to which both natures belong, the divine and the human, not only according to his divinity, but according to and with his received human nature. He is our brother, Hebrews 2.17, and we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, Genesis 2.23. He has instituted his holy supper for the certain assurance and confirmation of this, so that he will be with us and dwell, work, and be effective in us, also according to that nature from which which he has flesh and blood. Okay, and so when we, we hear that language, we think about, and this actually 
if you watch which way I'm looking during the service, it kind of tells you what's going on a little bit. So when Christ is speaking to us, I'm looking at you guys because it comes from heaven through me to you. And then when we're taking our things to God, I turn around, like when we do the intro, when we pray, all that stuff, uh, sing hymns of praise, we, I turn around and we're taking what we're doing toward God this way. I mean, it's just symbolic. But which way you're facing tells you who's doing what, basically, in the service. So if I'm looking at you, God's doing something right now. And if I'm looking at the altar, we're responding to what God has done. Which pe most people know that. But it's just interesting once in a while they're like, stop and look at the mechanics of the service, what we do in liturgy, and why we do the things we do. Uh, let's see. So when he's facing us, he brings blessing. And when we're facing God, we're bringing our, our petitions to him. Now, that verse 725, 725? Yeah, which backs up a couple verses. But whenever you stand praying, forgive, so that I'm reading the wrong book of the Bible. It's getting the right book of the Bible. Therefore, he is able also to save, forget, save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercessions for him. So that verse teaches Christ's perpetual intercession and it shapes the way we pray as a people who live in that new covenant of grace. So no more of this sacrifice stuff. So that's why we say through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God down forever. That's why we said in Jesus' name we pray. That's why we do that because he is the intercessor. He, he hears all your prayers. He carries them to the ears of the Father. Uh, so his intercession for us shapes our prayers then because we're praying all things in his name. And he takes those, makes them pleasing to his father's ears. Because when we say, I pray in Jesus' name, that makes it pleasing to his ears. And since we pray together with our high priest, we're assured that our prayers are heard, that our prayers are received as if they were from the lips of Christ himself. So that... Anything we pray, it's just as if Jesus is praying it for us because he carries it directly to him. And then the apology of the Augsburg Confession. Again, apology means defense, not we're sorry. Uh, it was more of we're sorry, you don't get it. <laughs> but yeah, article, let's see, article four of the apology on justification talks about how our access to God is only through Christ. And I'll just read that briefly. If I can find where I am. 141. 141. 141. Really? What have I done? I have written down stupid numbers, so we won't be reading them. <laughs> Never mind. There's not that many paragraphs in it. I screwed something up. 4376. That's why I don't like this book, because the numbering system is slightly different than I'm used to. Oh, yeah, see? Because it's got different... That's why I'm still going. Okay, here we go. In this book, it's Article Five. Uh, don't ask. They made this reader's edition of the Book of Concord, and I don't. I have my Scholastic edition with all the cool footnotes, which is the way it's supposed to be. But they changed the numbering system to try to make it easier, and all it's done is confuse people who use this to teach because we can't find anything. All right. So, uh, for when we come to the Father through Christ, when forgiveness of sins has been received, then we are truly certain that we have a God that is. God cares for us. We call upon him. We give him thanks. We fear him. We love him. As John 4.19 teaches, we love because he first loved us. In other words, we love him because he gave his son for us and forgave our sins. In this way, John shows that faith comes first and love follows. And then paragraph 294. Says... 
from this foundation, it can easily be decided why we attribute justification to faith and not to love. Love follows faith because love is the fulfilling of the law. But Paul teaches that we are justified not from the law, but from the promise which is received only through faith. We neither come to God without Christ as mediator, nor receive the forgiveness of sins for the sake of our love, but for the sake of Christ. And that gets to something I talk about a lot, which is it's not about our feelings. You know, it's not how you feel about God. It's how you believe about God, how your faith about God. Because sometimes you're, you might be angry at him. Sometimes you don't understand him. A lot of times we don't understand him. You know, it's not about leaving church feeling uplifted. If you do, fantastic. But some days you're going to leave church and you're just going to be, eh. Yet some people feel if they don't feel euphoric, exactly, happy, exactly. the church didn't meet their needs. The church has failed me. I need to find a different church. Yes. And that is the problem with the church in America today. And it's happening in England. It's starting to happen even in Africa as the Pentecostal movement spreads. Uh, because the Pentecostal movement is getting huge in England for some reason. Um, and Jonathan Fisk wrote, wrote in one of his books about this. He's a young Lutheran pastor, but he went through this whole, he was raised Lutheran, he loved Lutheranism, he joined the Happy Clappy Churches, and he came back to being Lutheran and eventually became a pastor. But he went through this where you have to do like the altar call and be born again and make a decision for Christ and all those things we don't acknowledge as being real. And they said the problem is, and when you look at statistics in churches, you see these huge churches with a thousand people on Sunday, you're like, boy, what do we gotta do to be like them? Well, they're making their church look like the world instead of a place you go to get away from the world, which is why we look different, why we play weird music, why we say weird things, why pastors wear weird clothes, why we are different from the when you walk in and go, this is not like where I just walked out of on purpose because this is separate from the world. When you make everything look like the world, well, then it's all about what makes you feel good. So people are going to church to hear these uplifting messages which are, are devoid of Christ, devoid of the gospel. They don't call you a sinner, which people love that. I make mistakes. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. And they have this emotionally manipulative music and messages to make you feel good. Just like when you go to a rock concert with 20,000 other people and that energy releases endorphins in your brains and makes you high from being in the group. It's our natural high from being with each other. Euphoria, like you said. And you go to that church for a while and you feel great. And this is awesome because that means God and I are on good terms, right? I'm right with the Lord because I feel this way till you don't. And then it's, what am I doing wrong? Or this church is failing me. I need to find a different church. And they go to the next one with a bigger show, with a bigger whatever, with even less gospel to get that feeling back. And these people are getting baptized over and over because oh, I, I, that baptism didn't take, I didn't really mean it. Now I'm really making a decision for God. I'm gonna testify, blah, blah, blah. And they do it again and again and again sometimes four or five times, and then they leave Christianity altogether because they don't realize there's an alternative like Catholicism for all of its errors, for like Lutheranism, like any of the solid denominations before they also tried to look like the world. They're chasing this feeling, mm -hmm. and it's not the feeling. The, the, I, I don't care how you feel on Sunday when you leave. I really don't. I care that you got fed. I don't care that you feel euphoric. Sometimes Sundays, you're gonna feel like that. Some Sundays, you're gonna go home going, I have no idea what he was talking about. I gotta think about that a minute. And then some days you're just gonna go, I just feel like a person and I'm leaving. I went, I... It's not about feeling high. And what they find out is these big churches with these 1,000 people or 800 people on a Sunday, and the ones in Texas, there's even like five, 6,000 people on a Sunday. How do you know who's in your church when you're that big? Or you uh, find a place to park. <laughs> they have parking decks. <laughs> so these people go to these big churches, but they're not the same people. I mean, you might, okay, we got our 20, 30, 40 people we have here, and it's the same 20, 30, 40 people that have been going here. And people grow up in the church, young ones come up, old folks die. I'm not pointing at you guys, by the way, it's just older folks die off, and it does cycle. But for the most part, you're in the church for a while, right? These people, they're there 
maybe a year, maybe 18 months, and then they're gone, but the numbers stay up because these are leaving for a bigger experience. This is the bigger experience for these people coming in. So it's a lie. There's not, they don't have a core group of a thousand people that are there. That's a revolving door. You know, it's like, oh, what do you feel like today? McDonald's or Chick-fil-A? Oh, we gotta go to McDonald's because Chick-fil-A is not open on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's the flavor of the week. It's not Christianity. Have you ever been to a church where they get, get you involved with these feelings? Um, we were with Bob Chili that time. And, it's a know, Methodist just, church. Ooh. And, and at first you kind of hold back. Oh, I'm a, oh 55 my, minute oh, sermon. But, but, but when they keep going and then you figure, well, I guess I better join in. <laughs> you know, why am I going to sit here? There, there is a certain feeling of movement there then mm -hmm. that feels good. Sure. Um, so, I mean. You may feel good, I felt foolish. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like. Uh, well, you were bucking it, though. You, you know, know, if you join in and just do it. <laughs> I don't care for her. So. No, I mean, there's a difference between, say, going to an African American church where they have a gospel choir and there's a lot of interactivity, mm -hmm. shall we say. But the preacher gets up there and actually preaches from the Bible. He's telling you you're a sinner. He's, he's giving you, he's feeding those people. And it happens to be a little less reserved, say, than, than, a, than a Lutheran service. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, and that's fantastic. That's a fantastic uh, thing that's unique to the United States, actually. But this other thing where it's, okay, well, we'll take all that and we'll just like take God out of it and we'll put our feelings and emotions in it yeah. and that's it. That's emotional manipulation. That's pure and simple. It's all about money. Even and, and and these preachers believe what they're selling because they still think they're 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 selling you a good life here on earth. And and Jesus never taught that. The Bible is very clear. The life on earth is hard. And by the way, if you follow me, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Jesus never promised you an abundant life. He said, if you have an abundant life here, be thankful, share. He never said, oh yeah, if you follow me, all your problems are going to be solved. No. So. The Lutheran Church, though, we're just more cut and dry. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a little stick in the muddy because yeah. we're old school, but that's fine. Uh, you know, and then some church, well, you know, we need to adopt, run, you know, we need to adopt some of this contemporary worship. We can do it right. We can do it Lutheran. And they try. And they don't. It's like, well, okay. Yeah, if you do nothing but songs from the hymnal, but you do, do it to peppier music, that's fine, because the content is solid. You know, I don't, I don't have a problem with doing hymns that aren't in the hymnal. If the theology is good, most of it is not. These praise songs is basically anything you can hear on the radio except you're talking about Jesus instead of your boyfriend or girlfriend. They're love songs to Jesus. They're, they're exactly what you can hear on the radio. And nobody can tell me any different because you can look up the lyrics and it's ugh. But, oh, we got to do that to attract the kids. Kids don't like it. <laughs> the kids don't like it at all. The baby boomers like it, but, but that's enough about that. So that, that I mean, the tradition is to preach Christ and him crucified, period. You know, uh, Luther was a rock star. He was a multi, one of the first multimedia like social media gurus, right? He, you know, he embraced the printing press. Lutherans invented the pamphlet. We invented the track. We were the first ones to do that stuff. And it worked, and they were able to disseminate stuff all over Europe. You know, that's how Protestantism grew so fast. Unfortunately, it wasn't Lutheran anymore because people got a little carried away. But there's nothing that says you can't adopt things from the time, but the church is timeless. I don't know how I got off on this soapbox, but it's one well, of it's, my it's one, interesting. It's one of my big soapbox issues because they want all of us to be yeah, to be like the world. They, for some reason, it's like, well, if we if we're like the world, we'll get more people in the pews, and it's great. So we have five hundred people, but if we're five hundred people who aren't confessing Jesus as Savior, we're not confessing that we are sinners in need of Him. And we're probably kind of bound for hell now. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. I'd rather stay small. But and first step is acknowledging 
Jesus is our once for all sacrifice, which the preacher to the Hebrews is making abundantly clear. So he, even after our justification, uh, the Apology of Oxford Confession has told us that it constantly emphasizes our only access to God is through Christ. You know, he is our mediator. He is our justifier. And we rely on the mercy of God. And we have access to that mercy through Christ. Through his priestly mediation, we are led to the Father, the Apology says. And that's and kind of ended that chapter. So Book of Concord, a lot of good stuff in it. It's not for everybody. It is not a page turning read by any means. I mean, the large catechisms in it, that's for everybody. Everybody should read it. Um, and again, you can read it online for free. Uh, Augsburg Confession is very dense. The Apology expands it, and it's very difficult. Formula of Concord, even more difficult. Um, the uh, the uh, small called articles is the last one of the last things Luther wrote. I recommend people look that up. That's kind of like his last will and testament. He was nearing the end of his life. There was going to be an ecumenical council like Vatican II, like Council of Nicaea, in a place called Schmalkald, uh, which never happened. But he wrote this because he knew he wouldn't be able to travel. He was too sick. Uh, so he wrote the Schmalkald articles as basically his last will and testament. This is what I believe. And this is what we Lutherans believe. And it's very accessible like most of his writing is. So I encourage people to read that. That one's pretty good. But the Portland Concord, Logsburg Confession, those are good things to read. But like I said, it's not for everybody. It, it, you have to uh, dedicate some time and some mental horsepower to get through it. It's not, it is not a page turner, but it's full of, of good stuff. Now, what was the name of that? Like you said, his last word. Small called. The small called articles. Oh, small. Yeah. Yeah. And it's probably one of one of his better. He wrote a lot of good stuff. He wrote a lot of not so good stuff. But that's one of his better. The large the catechisms. Come on. The large catechism is brilliant. Small called articles are close second. It's good stuff. Okay. So that finished chapter seven, and we move on to chapter now chapter nine because we're only covering those parts of Hebrews that we hear during the church here in the lectionary. Chapter 8 is not in it. Uh, and there's no problem skipping it. Uh, it's some more quoting. It actually wasn't that long a chapter. It was a long quote uh, from Jeremiah, basically. Uh, verses eight, Chapter 8, 8 through 12, was a long quote from, uh, of a prophecy from Jeremiah. And then usually what the preacher has been doing in Hebrews is then he tells you all about it and about how it foreshadows Christ and Christ is better. Uh, he doesn't do that in this case. He, so he had, quotes this prophecy from Jeremiah and instead he lays out how the tent of the first covenant was a foreshadowing of Jesus's liturgical ministry. Like, okay, that's different. Um, so what we're actually going to do is we will read part of actually we're not even going to read part of chapter 9 yet today we are going to look at a couple of important things in the Old Testament uh, which we will use uh, from here on out again to, uh, to see how the writer to the Hebrews is using those Old Testament Old Covenant circumstances and showing how that is fulfilled bigger better or more through Christ in the New Covenant. Okay, so we will look at, first of all, uh, the use of blood to consecrate Israel. That would be Exodus 24. You're like, boy, we're using the Old Testament a lot in this, but when you think about it, when... Um, when this was written, when the writer to the Hebrews wrote this, it's not like they have the Bible like we have it yet. You know, there's some letters of Paul floating around. There may have been some of the Gospels even written by now. Uh, but the Bible for these people is still, you know, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so that when they're reading Scripture, that's what they're reading. So Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 8.
Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship as a, at a distance, this is God speaking. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses wrote righteousness in the side. You know, the people spoke with one voice. That's what we're supposed to do. And that doesn't mean we recite something together. Um, it means we're really all supposed to believe the same thing. So you know, I wish we would talk to each other more about doctrinal things once in a while. Because, you know, if we have 35, people, 40 people sitting in the pews, we have 35 or 40 different ways of looking at everything. We don't look at everything exactly the same because we're human. I just wish we talked about that. That's what speaking with one voice is. Uh, we're really supposed to do that as a synod too. That's going to take a while. Uh, sorry about that. So Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, verse 4. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the sprinkling of the blood sealed the covenant. And so just as a, an aside too, whenever you have a covenant, a covenant means a cut. Like if you made, you actually means to cut a covenant. So if you made a covenant with somebody, you slaughtered an animal and you walked in between the two halves of it and got blood on you. That was part of the deal. So whenever there is a covenant, blood must be shed. And that's important when we start talking about Christ. Okay, so that's how people affirm their covenant with God. They got blood splatter down. Now we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 16. We're going to talk about the Day of Atonement. The next book. Leviticus. Which chapter? Leviticus chapter 16 first of all. So Leviticus 16 beginning in verse 8. Okay, so it says, uh, yeah, chapter 16 is about the entire law of atonement. Verse 8 begins talking eight, about yeah. the actual day. Yeah. Okay, Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive to the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself to make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the Ark of the Testimony. Otherwise, he will die. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. 
and it shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it, and from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrate it. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And you shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. He shall bathe his body with water in a holy place and put on his clothes and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall offer up in smoke the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The one who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Then afterward he shall come into the camp. But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be taken outside the camp, and they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse in the fire. Then the one who burns them shall wash his clothes and make, bathe his body with water, and then afterwards he shall come into the camp. Okay, so you've got all this mm-hmm. stuff you got to do, and you got to do it right. And Aaron has to do the blood offering in the most holy place just so, or he can die. <coughs> so he has to carry that that incense, the two handfuls finely ground sweet-smelling incense that he has to burn. He has to have bring that in burning with a big cloud of smoke so he doesn't see even now. He's inside the curtain. He's looking at the Ark of the Covenant. He's looking at the mercy seat between the two cherubim. He still can't look right at it. He's got to have this cloud of smoke to obscure his vision so that he doesn't die because you still can't look at at God directly and live. Uh, So that's Yom Kippur. If you have Jewish friends, that's the Day of Atonement. And then the goat, the scapegoat. Uh, the, what does the ESV have? Does it talk about the, the goat for for uh, Azazel? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Azazel. Yeah, Azazel. Azazel. So the, the scapegoat or the goat dedicated to Azazel, which is uh, a name of the demon. It's the devil, more or less. So the sins of the people are put on this goat, sent into the wilderness, basically to the devil. They send their sort of. So Azazel is this this kind of demon of the underworld. So that's what that is all about. So they send this animal out, and then even the people who touch this animal, they have to go through a ritual purification because this animal is now unclean because they have the sins of the people put on. So you've got all this ritual. You have to be very careful to make sure you're clean and doing things in the right place. Uh, it's a lot of work, and it's imperfect. You know, you, you have to do all these things, but it's still, because men are sinful, they have to go through all these extra steps to ensure they do it right, because they are, even though they're the priest or the high priest, they're sinners. So you've got to do all this stuff. You have to take your clothes off. You have to wash. You, you can't just go do it, and then you're done. You have to go through all the steps of you have to clean yourself to do this, and then when you're done, you're cleaning yourself again. Doing all these steps, it's complicated. Uh, Leviticus 23, let me see if that is worth reading tonight. 23, 26. Yeah, this is a good one. We'll read this really quick. Uh, Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 32. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on exactly the 10th day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You should not do any work on the same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. As for any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no work at all, is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and in all your dwelling places. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls on the ninth 
the month at evening, from evening until evening you shall keep the Sabbath. So Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur is a big deal. You're not allowed to do any kind of work whatsoever. And today, if you know any practicing Jews, you'll know on the Day of Atonement you don't see them. They are they are not working. They don't answer the phone. I had a customer who is a very Orthodox Jew. Day of Atonement, you can get a hold of them. You better, and even if it's an emergency, he would not answer the phone. You had to get your business done the day before, before the end of the day, and otherwise, 24 hours later, you could get a hold of them. Otherwise, you weren't going to hear from them. I mean, even today, they take that very, very, very strictly, very seriously. So what do they do? Uh, nothing, since they don't have the temple. They don't do these uh, sacrifices. It's basically a day of fasting and prayer. Um, but they they isolate themselves from the world. They cut themselves off. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you have all this um, symbolism in the tabernacle uh, that the beginning of chapter 9 is going to talk about. Uh, and we'll begin reading that next week. We won't get into it. But you do have some things to think about in the meantime. Uh, as far as the tabernacle is concerned, you have uh, two... I should have made you guys a picture of the tabernacle. Do I have one? Yeah, of course I do. I'll try to remember a Bible atlas next week and get you guys a good picture of the tabernacle. But, you know, you picture the tabernacle and then inside the tabernacle is the holy place. And then you have like the incense altar, the altar with the showbread on it, the candelabra. And then you have the curtain where the most holy place, the, whole, the holy of holies was. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. So you have these steps where it's getting holier and holier as you walk in. Uh, so you have a tent and a tent within the tent, sort of. Mm -hmm. Okay, And all this stuff is, is symbolic. And that kind of why our church is still built on the same kind of idea. You know, you have the sanctuary that would be like being in the tent of meeting. And then the chancel is the holy place, the altar that is the most holy place. It is as a uh, parallel of what it was. So you have spatial symbolism. You have time, temporal symbolism. You have cosmological symbolism. You have personal symbolism, you have covenantal symbolism, you have liturgical symbolism that all goes with these two kind of stages. So spatially you have the outer tent and the inner tent. Temporally you have the present time and then a representation of eternity. So you get the most holy place where God comes to dwell. That's outside of time and space. You'll keep hearing me tell that because... The most holy place belongs to God. So if it belongs to God, it belongs to God's domain, which is outside of time and space. So cosmologically, when you enter the tent of meeting, you are, you know, on earth. When you enter the most holy place, that's where God comes to dwell, that is heaven. That's where heaven comes to earth. Uh, The same with, uh, you know, liturgically. When we bring our prayers and supplications to God, where we're here on earth and we're worshiping God in heaven, but we are looking forward to the service in heaven that's even better, the, the eternal service to come, which comes again to earth in the Lord's Supper. Heaven comes to earth. That's why we can say with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, because that actually transcends time and space. We have all of that imagery uh, in the divine service and you have that imagery, that symbolism in the tabernacle as well. And then next week we will get into and I will make sure I have a I actually have a little picture of the tabernacle but it's too small for you to see. We will talk about the role of the high priest on the day of atonement, all that stuff we just read and Christ's role as our high priest in the uh, his once for all atonement on the cross, and that'll take us uh, a while, a couple weeks probably, to get through all of that. But that will get us through chapters uh, nine and a good bit of ten.
Okay. Questions, comments? It was a little short tonight. Sorry about that. I think all the all the Old Testament stuff is interesting, like the Day of Atonement. Yeah, to see the symbolism that's happening and see how that Christ fulfilled all of those things also. You know, he is modeled the our atonement by Christ is modeled after that first covenant. The way all those first covenant things happened, but they're made perfect now. And I don't think we ever actually read that. We don't read about the Day of Atonement in church ever, do we? I don't think we do. We don't read that much of the Leviticus in church. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to look in the lecture. I know we read from Leviticus very, very rarely, and it's usually not about that kind of stuff. It's like giving of the Ten Commandments, giving of the law, that kind of thing. Yeah. 